From the early days when the University of Illinois was known as Illinois Industrial University, band music has been an important part of campus life. As a land-grant college, military instruction was mandatory for all male students. And the military band performed martial music at parades and reviews for Illinois' cadet regiment and ceremonial music at campus-wide events. The role of the university's band was about to change when Paris, Illinois native Albert Austin Harding enrolled in the fall of 1902. No one could have predicted the lasting impact the 22-year-old engineering major would have on the University of Illinois, and more importantly, the future of bands throughout the world. Rising through the ranks of the University of Illinois military band, Harding quickly earned the spot as first chair cornet was soon noticed by then band director and director of the School of Music, Frederick Locke Lawrence. In the fall of 1905, Professor Lawrence asked Harding to take his place as band director, a position he would hold for the next 43 years. Taking inspiration from the professional touring bands of the day, Gilmore, Sousa, and Goldman, Harding expanded the repertoire and instrumentation of the military band and expanded its performances beyond the parade ground to the auditorium, where it exposed appreciative audiences to orchestral transcriptions of the classics. One of the things that uh, made the university band as great as it was, was the transcriptions that Dr. Harding made. And he would spend many, many hours doing this, often late at night, sometimes after midnight. And the word was around that he would take after midnight, go out in his car and take a big drive through the, to the uh, countryside with a big black cigar, and letting himself kind of uh, relax after all this uh, work of the day. As one of the most influential figures in the history of the wind band, Harding worked tirelessly to promote the concert band as a serious musical ensemble and have the band recognized in the music education curriculum. It was during this time that community bands moved from the fraternal lodges and volunteer fire departments to the public school classrooms, affording almost every young boy and girl the opportunity to learn to play a musical instrument. His lasting impact on college bands is evidenced by those he mentored. William D. Ravelli at Michigan, Frederick Fennell at Eastman, and his former assistants Ray Dvorak at Wisconsin, Clarence Sawhill at UCLA, and Glenn Cliff Bainham at Northwestern. The band programs and traditions at each of these fine institutions were strongly influenced by Harding, whose insight and innovation remains a guiding force today. Well, as a high school student uh, starting to learn to play the clarinet, uh, in, in those days, a lot, of, a lot of us went over to the band building and we took lessons in that old uh, big, big building. And uh, it was just a, a real uh, inspiration to us to go over and hear the band inside and then hear it when the, when the bands were on parade and so on. And he uh, was a man who, when he was conducting, we had, he had our complete attention and it was a, really a, a, a great thing to be under the influence of, of, of Dr. Harding. Harding was an admirer of John Philip Sousa and his band and the feeling was mutual. Sousa was the consummate showman, Harding was the consummate music educator. Sousa conducted the University of Illinois Band on many occasions, composing the University of Illinois March and dubbing the University of Illinois Band the world's greatest college band. Sousa was so impressed with Harding's work at Illinois, especially the organization and meticulous care of the band library, that upon his death in 1932, he bequeathed to Harding and the University of Illinois Bands his personal library of band music, shipped in 39 large wooden trunks, weighing 9,170 pounds. One of the hallmarks of the Harding era was live concert band broadcasts on WILL radio. During these live performances, Harding often called out a march and expected his band to sight read it flawlessly. Every Friday, they would come to the band building at 5 o'clock, and Dr. Harding would have the music 
that he thought would be appropriate for those times. We looked forward to the rehearsals, although we knew that we were going to have to do things just right for Dr. Hardy. He wanted everything perfect. In recognition of his many contributions, legendary American bandmaster Edwin Franco Goldman invited Harding to become a founding member of the American Bandmasters Association, the first music educator to be so honored. Harding retired in 1948 and died at his Champagne home in 1958. The legacy that Harding built was to grow and flourish under his protege, assistant director Mark Hubert Hinesley, who succeeded him as the second director of bands. Born in 1905 in Randolph County, Indiana, Hinesley entered Indiana University in 1921. Like Harding, he did not enroll as a music major. He received his bachelor's degree in chemistry with high distinction in 1925. While in Indiana, Hinesley played first chair cornet in the university band, and again, like Harding, served as student director his senior year. After graduation, Hinesley became director of the Indiana University Band, receiving his Master of Music degree in 1927. Hinesley gained national prominence as director at Cleveland Heights High School in Cleveland, Ohio from 1929 to 1933. Frederick Fennell stated that Mr. Hinesley's Cleveland Heights High School Band was the best traditional marching band he had ever seen. While teaching at the National Music Camp at Interlochen, Michigan, Hinesley found time to write Band Aten Chun, the first of eight important music education texts. He came to Illinois in 1934, and as director of the Marching Illini, Hinesley devised intricate halftime drills considered revolutionary at the time, mixing animation and pageantry never before seen on a college football field. The U of I bands at that time was a role model. A number of the great bands that are around the, the country are, are graduates. But at that time we have a mar had a marvelous marching band and Mark Hinesley developed a system for, for developing uh, halftime shows uh, that, that were really quite spectacular. Mark Hinesley on the left, head of the band department, shows the hard work in glamorizing the Saturday game. It's as complicated as football strategy itself. He would use these little half-inch screws to represent a band member, and the motions that we would go through going from one formation to another were really pretty unique, and it really captured the imagination, not only of other musicians, but of uh, radio announcers that used to announce uh, the football games, because they they would announce the halftime shows. They were so great. One of his most inventive creations, the three-in-one, is still one of the university's most cherished traditions, nearly 70 years after its debut. Though Hinesley constantly experimented with technology and instrument construction and tuning, one of his greatest contributions was his extensive and masterful library of orchestral transcriptions. Undoubtedly influenced by Harding's early transcriptions, Hinesley would soon achieve greater acclaim than his mentor, amassing an impressive catalog of music that is still sold and performed throughout the world today. In the development of bands in the early days, the bands mainly, mainly played march music and, and kind of concert music in the park, very light kind of uh, material. But as the bands moved along, and they would take or an orchestral score and transfer it to the band instruments. And when you had the, the sonority sound of, a, of a, a group of wind instruments and percussion instruments. It was just really quite brilliant. And what it did for the people in the band program, it exposed them to orchestral material, which many times they did not have the opportunity to do that. Mr. Hinesley was a master at that. Hinesley pioneered an ambitious recording program, producing 59 LP records, widely acclaimed as some of the best examples of repertoire and interpretation. Like many of his era, Hinesley's time in Illinois was interrupted by World War II. Commissioned in 1943 in the Army Air Corps, he served as music officer of the Air Training Command. He subsequently attained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and was released from active duty in 1946. Hinesley served as a friend and mentor to two extremely capable and popular assistants. 
Marching Illini director Everett D. Kissinger, and assistant director Guy M. Duker. One of his personal achievements was the construction in 1955 of the Harding Band Building that replaced the temporary World War I era building that was home to the band for more than 40 years. A compulsive handyman and tinkerer, he designed and built in his home basement workshop a high-tech podium outfitted with the latest tuning, recording, and playback equipment for the new building. When Dr. Heinsley took over the band, he needed to have a different kind of uh, podium that he would like to use because of his recording equipment that he wanted there. So what he did was to build his own, and it was really a, a, a master uh, piece. And it was interesting because uh, when he set the thing up in the band room, the uh, people from the physical plant who were with the union came over to inform him that he could not use the podium because it wasn't built with union laborers, so he had to take it out. Uh, my understanding is that they took it all apart and put it back together again, the union carpenters, and now they could use the, the podium in the band building. Hinesley served as director of bands from 1948 until his retirement in 1970 and was awarded an honorary doctorate degree from Indiana University in 1972. Dr. Hinesley died in Urbana in 1999. Third director of bands, Harry Beejan, was born in Pontiac, Michigan in 1921. He organized and conducted his first band and orchestra while in his late teens and studied conducting at Tanglewood, the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Wayne State University in Detroit and his doctorate from the University of Michigan. Like his predecessor, Mark Hinesley, Beejan achieved prominence in the public schools, Detroit's Cass Technical High School. Cass High School Band was hailed as one of the finest ensembles in the nation. Beejan held director of band's positions at Wayne State University and Michigan State University. Following Mark Hinesley's retirement in 1970, he came to Illinois. In 1971, Beejan inaugurated the conducting mentorship program at the University of Illinois. It was envisioned as a means of allowing outstanding young conductors a concentrated focus on the craft of conducting and hands-on administration of a model university band program. I, I spent hours and hours and hours in his studio uh, gleaning as much information as I could because it became apparent to me he was a great resource. And it would be like seeing a great football team and, and they become national champions. Well, you want to learn about the coach. How did the coach make that happen? What, what's, what, are the, what are his characteristics that caused him to develop national championship teams? So that became the uh, factor that influenced me in my admiration for him. And for me, it was just like a little kid in a toy shop being around the person that has accomplished all the things that I would just dream about. And, and, and then a person who was so unselfish that he would share those ideas with me. I don't even think he would realize it, except that if, if he were to hear my band, he would realize that the sound of my band is a direct outgrowth of all his influences. During Beejan's tenure, the size and number of ensembles in the university's band program increased dramatically. He hired Gary Smith as director of the Marching Illini, who updated the band's marching style while maintaining its distinctive and beloved sound. And then one time, uh, John Heath was playing string bass. And um, he had a, a solo entrance, and, and Beejan cued him, and he missed it. And he stops the band and says, John, a blind man could have seen that cue. And again, I'd have to leave a room and go out in the hall and laugh because some of the things he would say uh, was hilarious, but the band, he was so intense, you know, that the band was afraid to laugh sometimes because they didn't know if he wanted them to laugh or not. He always also had what the band used to call the beam. Well, that's if you made a mistake or you were goofing around or something. He could look you square in the eye and the kids would swear there was a beam that went from his eye into you, and you didn't want to get hit by the beam. I mean, there was nothing more scary than to be sitting there and then get nailed by the beam. Beejan continued and expanded Hinesley's recording project, 
producing over 50 LP recordings of important wind band repertoire with the University of Illinois Symphonic Band. Of particular importance were Bijan's interpretations of Percy Granger's works for band. These recordings have served as inspiration for countless band conductors. Bijan retired in 1984. Not yet ready to give up the baton, though, Bijan went on to serve as conductor of the Purdue University Symphonic Band from 1985 to 1987. Currently, he serves on the editorial staff of The Instrumentalist and the board of directors of the Midwest International Band and Orchestra Clinic. Dr. Bijan is a charter member of the American School Band Directors Association and past president of the American Bandmasters Association. Following the retirement of Harry Bijan in 1984, James Keene was selected as director of bands, only the fourth person to hold this prestigious position at the University of Illinois. James Frederick Keene was born in Detroit, Michigan. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Michigan, where he was a student of the legendary William D. Ravelli. Keene was director of bands at the University of Arizona. Prior to that, he taught at East Texas State University, the University of South Carolina, the University of Michigan, and Louisiana Tech University. During his tenure at Illinois, Keene began and cultivated a program of international outreach. This outreach included guest conducting and lecturing in four continents, as well as the recruitment of talented students for the University of Illinois. Uh, Jim Keene is truly one of the leaders in our profession. He has been uh, on the boards, has been vice president and president of every major collegiate professional organization there is. Uh, this band has traveled uh, and shared its experiences with people all over the world. Uh, it has made recordings and continues to do so, providing not just reference recordings, but recordings you want to just sit down and listen to as a patron of music. The people that have been brought in to participate in this program, the guest conductors, people who have visited the campus, uh, are immeasurable. They are literally a who's who of the band world. Keene has also amassed the largest body of commissions of any director of bands, personally commissioning or co-commissioning nearly 20 new works for wind band. With, with Jim, uh, his, his intensity comes from a tremendous knowledge of the music and, and how to bring it to its highest level. Uh, he perhaps is the best rehearsal technician I've ever seen on the podium. Most of the great performances occur in this room in rehearsal. The performance at Cranert or any other venue, that in a, a lot of ways for me is secondary to what happens with the interaction in rehearsal. And that is him knowing and pouring out his emotions through the baton, through the rehearsal. Um, and, and again, bringing that forward in, in many, many different ways. Of lasting importance, Keene has enthusiastically encouraged the formalization of the Alumni Band Association, which has expanded its scope from that of a once a year homecoming performing ensemble to a year-round support group of advocates for the university bands. Like all his predecessors at Illinois, Keene is past president of the prestigious American Bandmasters Association. He served on the board of directors for the Percy Granger Society, the John Philip Sousa Foundation, and the Goldman Memorial Band of New York City. Most recently, Keene was named an honorary lifetime member of the Texas Bandmasters Association, becoming only the sixth person to be so honored in the 55-year history of the association. For the past 100 years, four legendary directors have personally influenced the lives of more than 10,000 students who have performed in the University of Illinois bands. And I walked right through those doors over there and uh, uh, the magic began. It was just incredible. And I saw all these chairs, I saw this great room and um, it, it just comes over you and it, it consumes you and it becomes a part of you for life. That's the true Illinois legacy.